is sigma squared. We never know, right? So that in practice, if you really want to calculate variance of uh, beta hat, we have to calculate sigma square first, right? Otherwise, this formula is infeasible. You, you have to, we have to calculate sigma square hat first so that to replace the sigma square by using our you know, feasible estimator, right? So how do we calculate sigma square hat? Very simple. Recall, sigma square is a variance of true UI, true error term, right? We don't know true error term, but we know residuals U hat, right? So we can calculate the variance of U hat to, so that we can replace you know, sigma square right here. So how do we calculate the variance of U hat? We use this formula. We use this formula. And so we got to estimate our sigma square hat equals to summation right, right hand side right here. This is a formula to calculate the variance of U I, I'm sorry, U I hat. <laughs> U hat is a residual so that we calculate the variance of U hat. So, so recall, how do we calculate the variance? Let me Google it for you, for example. Variance, the formula for variance Usually something like this, something like summation xi minus x bar squared divided by n minus one, you know, sometimes n, sometimes n minus one, sometimes n minus k. But anyway, summation x minus x bar. In my case, in my case, my u hat centered to be zero so that, you know, the average of u hat is zero. That's why, that's why for the formula, I don't have the x bar term because the average of u hat is zero, right? So that this term reduces to zero. So that simply, you know, residual square summation divided by n minus one, right? That's the reason why, that's the reason why, I, you know, my formula come from. And uh, you may wonder why sometimes divided by n, sometimes n minus one, sometimes n minus k in general. And so in general, I write down it should be n minus k. Why? First of all, what's k? What's k? K is number of unknown parameters. For example, in my regression, unknown parameters are alpha and a beta. I'm trying to calculate alpha beta, right? So I have two unknowns. So for my regression, if I have if I have run the regression y over x, I have alpha, I have beta, so I have two of them. In my case, actually it should be n minus two. So now, you know, that's the interesting question. Why sometimes you see the formula n minus one, sometimes n minus two, n minus k in general, right? Yes, let me explain the story right here to you. n minus k, we have a terminology for it. It's called degree of freedom. Degree of freedom. What's the idea of a degree of freedom? Very simple. Recall, n is my sample size. So n is simple size, again, the larger is the better, right? N is just like how, how much money I have. And so I have n pieces of information. Based on those n pieces of information, I want to estimate alpha, I want to estimate beta, so that I, I just like, you know, I want to buy two items. By using n amount of money, I want to purchase alpha, purchase beta. I want to buy two items, right? So, so of course, you know, ideally, n the larger is better, k the smaller is better, right? In other words, I hopefully I'm filthy rich. I have a really large n, and I just want to buy, I, you know, two items, right? The bad case, of course, it'll be I'm a poor man. My n is small, and I have to buy. I want to buy many, many, you know, <laughs> you know, items, right? In that case, for example, suppose in my regression, my sample size is only say. 46 or 30 or 20. My sample size n is small, but I want to run the regression. You know, I want to put x1, x2, x3. I want to put, say, 20 of those axes into my regression. <laughs> the short answer is that, sorry, <laughs> you cannot. You, you know, your sample size is too small so that you cannot afford to, to put so many axes in your regression. In other words, your n is too small. You're too poor so that you cannot afford 
who purchased so many different items, right? So <laughs> that's a you know regret. N and N and K. As again, hopefully N is large, K is small. What's N minus K? We call N minus K to be our degree of freedom. Why? Because right here, we try to calculate the variance of residuals. We try to calculate the variance of residuals. If residuals are something we directly observe, for example, if we directly observe the true UI, then we calculate the variance of formula. Actually, you know, you can directly divide by n or n minus one because those are original, you know, original information you have. But right here, our U hat, we do, of course, we do not observe the, 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 the U hat, right? We calculate U hat. How do we calculate U hat? You had the formula is still remember y minus y bar uh, y hat right? What's y hat? Y hat is calculated based on alpha hat and beta hat, right? So the procedure is uh, based on n pieces of information. I calculate alpha hat or beta hat first, right? So that I have uh, I have my y hat. Once I have y hat, I use y minus y hat so that I calculate u hat, right? In other words. When I get my U hat, it's already you know, starting from N pieces information. I've already spent two of them on alpha and beta, right? So that talking about U hat, which is residuals, the information I have will be N minus two now, right? So that's the information I have talking about residuals U hat, right? So <laughs> the information, in other words, the money I have is N minus two. Right, I, because I've already spent information on two of them, alpha and beta. Right. Later on, if you have, say, x one, x two, x three, x four, for example, if you have, say, ten of those axes, you have beta one, beta two, beta three, until beta ten. Right. Hence, don't forget alpha, so that you have ten betas plus alpha, so that you have eleven unknown parameters. Right. So that in that case, your n minus k will be n minus eleven so that your residues, the degree of freedom for residues will be N minus 11. And for example, if, you're N, if you have 1,000, uh, you know, if you say this information, your sample size is 1,000, then your degree of freedom, talk about residues, degree of freedom will be 1,000 minus 11, right? That's the idea of a degree of freedom. So that, you know, again, when we calculate the, the variance of residuals, that's why we divide it by n minus k rather than n or n minus one. So that this degree freedom always corresponding to the how many, how, you know, how much information you have corresponding to your u hat, right? So uh, it's just like, uh, uh, let me tell a little joke. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, a little joke about econometrics is uh, we have two estimators sitting in a bar. Uh, yes, in a bar, we econometricians, uh, we always like to go to bar <laughs> to drink. So, <laughs> yeah, this is also true in general. Econometricians, you know, like to drink. So, <laughs> in a bar, two estimators, they're sitting in a bar and they talk to each other. One of the estimators just got married. So the other one asked him, you know, hey brother, uh, how's your life after you get married? So the first estimator replied, uh, nothing much, but I just lose my degree of freedom. So, you know, so that's basically the idea, you know, n minus k. For example, when I get married, uh, I, uh, before, when I play bachelor and when I single, I can do whatever I, you know, I spend, play with my friends, play basketball, play volleyball. But once I get married, I have to spend a lot of time for my wife, right? <laughs> she needs to, you know, go, go shopping so that I have to drive her to the shopping mall. My degree of freedom becomes N minus one. Later on, I have two kids. <laughs> my, <laughs> so that my degree of freedom becomes N minus Three, right? Don't forget alpha. You know, my, my wife is intercept. <laughs> wife is a very important intercept. So, so my degree of freedom becomes a minus three now, right? I have to spend a lot of time during the weekend. So, 
my my son, he, you know, for his uh, soccer game, my my daughter has a volleyball game, <laughs> so that uh, I have to drive them uh, around. I always I, I always feel my I, I feel like I am a Uber driver, or we can drive everywhere to to deliver them back, back and forth. So <laughs> uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, if your degree freedom is still and or or in minus one, just in, still enjoy your free time. <laughs> I, uh, my my degree freedom is already in minus three now. <laughs> That's the little story about uh, degree freedom. So that hopefully after this little story, you guys always remember what's the intuition of this uh, degree of freedom. <laughs> so, uh, let's. Uh, uh, by the way, n minus k in your computer output, even computer output, it is right here, 44. This is my n minus k. And similarly, also reported right here, n minus k. So <laughs> my sample size is uh, 46, right? We have 46 states. Why 46 states? Uh, uh, but anyway, in the, in the data set, if you have everything, you should have 50. But in this data set, only have 46 states. N is 46. We have alpha, we have beta, so N minus K is 44. And that, <laughs> so N minus K actually also. By the way, that's the degree freedom corresponding to residuals, right? <laughs> so... Now let's move on to talk about t-test. Uh, this is a important, basic and important chapter in the contents. We're gonna do t-test all the time. So that uh, uh, actually there are three equivalent ways to do a t-test. Uh, each of them has its own advantage, disadvantage. Since uh, let's first of all introduce the details of those uh, t-tests and then let's compare them to figure out what's the advantage for each of them. Then shall we use a method one, number one, then shall we use a method number two, number three, so on so forth. So let's start to introduce. Uh, for, for regression, y over x, for regression, y over x, very often we want to perform a test, h now, which is a beta is a zero or not. Beta is really zero, now why do we care about this? Very simple. If beta is really zero, simply plug in zero right here. If beta is really zero, zero times x, of course, zero, right? So that in that case, it means x has nothing to do with y at all, right? If beta is really zero, y reduces to y equals to alpha plus ui. So that's, uh, there's no x, right? That's why we care about the test. True beta, is that really zero or not? Right, they, we call it H null. We write down something like H zero, but we call it H null because this is our null hypothesis, right? So opposite is H one. Beta is non-zero. It's not a zero. So in this class, we always uh, talk about we call it two-sided test. In other words, the opposite is uh, you know H null is zero. Opposite is beta not zero. In your statistic courses before, you might learn the one-sided test. In other words, the, in that case, your H1 might be something like beta larger than zero or not, or beta smaller than zero or not. But anyway, uh, in this course, we, we, we only care about two-sided tests because unless you have a reason, right, why you care about, say, beta is uh, always larger than zero, or why you always care about beta is smaller than zero, right? Unless you have a reason to, to care about why you want to know beta is, uh, say, <laughs> one side, right? But otherwise, in general, usually in this course, we always uh, care about two-sided, zero or non-zero, right? So but anyway, one-sided test, very similar. But, uh, but anyway, we only require two-sided test. So uh, to perform a test, we're going to introduce, uh, this is a t-test. What's a t-test? We're going to introduce three different ways. They're equivalent. The first way, we calculate something called a t-ratio or t-value. This is a beta hat divided by standard error of a beta hat. For example, 
recall our regression. This is our beta hat, right? Our regression says beta hat is a negative one point something, basically negative one. So you care about the true beta is a zero or not. Now computer says our beta hat is a negative one, one, one point something, right? So you are thinking about uh, negative one. This is kind of close to zero, but uh, still can not exactly zero, right? So how do I supposed to know this number, negative one, is that uh, close to zero or far away from zero, right? Similarly, suppose your regression got a coefficient, say 0 0.5, is that close enough? Or 0 0.1, is that close enough? I don't know, right? I don't have a clear uh, cutting off value to, to tell, you know, uh, what kind of beta is large, what kind of beta is small, right? That's why we calculate something called a T-ratio. What's a T-ratio? We use a first number divided by second number so that we got to the third number, which is our T-value, computer called T-value. I personally, I always like to call it a T-ratio because it is a ratio, right? First number divided by second number. So now the third number, T-ratio, now I know how large is large, how small is small, because from theory, from a T-distribution, if you check out those uh, significance level, for example, a T distribution, if you check out both sides, both sides, you know, the summation of both, both tails equal to 5%, uh, we got a cutting all value, roughly speaking, 1.96. So that roughly speaking, if your T ratio is larger than 1.96, basically you're far away from zero. If your T ratio is smaller than 1.96, roughly speaking, then you know you're close to zero, right? So that's that's why that's why first way, if you want to use a T ratio to make your conclusion, you simply compare the T ratio you got right here, compare what's a uh, cutting off value. Cutting off value right here, roughly speaking, it's 1.96. I'm gonna discuss this in detail in a second, but roughly speaking the cutting off value is, is kind of close to 1.96. So that, for example, say, suppose my T ratio is say, is a larger than 1.96. For example, say, my T ratio is a three or negative three in terms of absolute value. It's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's always three, right? No matter probably it's three or negative three, it's a three in terms of absolute value. So three is larger than 1.96 in terms of absolute value so that we reject and now. How do we understand this? Because a T distribution, uh, I, I show you a T distribution in a second. T is very similar to a normal distribution. So that so that if you're you know if you're far away from the center T that it is far away from the center, basically correspondingly your beta also far away from the center is zero, right? So that's why if you get a large T ratio, Basically, you're, you got a large, large beta hat, right? So if you got a large beta hat, basically we say, sorry, it's kind of, your beta is far away from the true value zero so that uh, it cannot be, true value beta cannot be zero at all. So that we, our conclusion is uh, we reject H null. So, so the, in other words, we say, you're, basically your beta won't be zero. It's far away from zero, right? That's a conclusion. Right here, a technical detail is, uh, strictly speaking, this cutting off value, cutting off value actually depends on degree of freedom n minus k. So a T distribution, a T distribution, you know, depends on n minus k, degree freedom. Then for different sample size and for different k, actually degree freedom, it varies. So for your case, for your regression, Actually, you know, your n minus k, it varies. Depends on your, for example, your sample size, right? Then you have a lower sample size and, or small sample size and degree freedom uh, cutting off value right here how could be totally different. So roughly speaking, it's 1.96. But for your case, you know, if you want to find a strict, you know, precise cutting off value, actually, you know, uh, it it will be slightly different from 1.96. Usually, slightly larger than 1.96. Something like 1.97, 1.98, so on the first. The smaller your sample size is, 
the larger this cutting off value. For example, if, you're, if you have only say 40 obduations, if you have only 30, 20 obduations, your cutting off value might be 1.97, 98, or it could be two point something. And so that's the cutting off value. But um, uh, so this is a first way, first way to show, you know, to, to do the T test. It's a very straightforward way. Uh, it's a straightforward because we simply use a T, T, T ratio, which is first number divided by second number, right? So it's a very straightforward, but uh, it's a little bit awkward in the sense the cutting off value, if you really want to look for the precise cutting off value, you have to either check a T table or use computer to check out the precise value, cutting off value, right? So that's the first way. By the way, by the way, the second number right here, standard error of beta hat, standard error of beta hat. This number is based on our variance of beta hat. We simply take square root. In other words, this number, this number, how, how does computer calculate this number 0 0.28? Computer, computer go back to the formula of variance of beta hat. This is a formula for variance of beta hat, right? So once computer plug in sigma square hat, first of all, replace this number by sigma square hat. And then, you know, computer can calculate variance of beta hat. Once computer have a variance of beta hat, take square root so that a computer have standard error of beta hat, right? <laughs> That's how computer calculate everything. That's that's how computer calculate this number. Computer gets a variance beta hat first and then take square root so that computer have a standard error of beta hat. That's a number. So beta hat divided by standard error of beta hat, computer got a T ratio. This number, let's do the exercise first. For example, even this example, our T ratio is a negative 4.253, right? In terms of absolute value, it's 4.253, which is larger than 1.96, right? Again, 1.96 may not be precise, but roughly speaking, it is 1.96, right? So our 4.253 4 is larger than 1.96, so that our conclusion is we reject and now. In other words, this T ratio is large. A large T corresponding to a large beta because T ratio is first number divided by the second number, right? If our beta, beta hat is large, basically it says, uh, sorry, it cannot be zero. It's too far away from zero, right? So that's why we reject the null. Each null is beta is zero. So that our conclusion is, uh, sorry, it cannot be zero. It's opposite, beta is non-zero, right? So that's the procedure, how to, how to do the t-test from the first way. That's how to do the t-test from the first way. Um, uh, there is it. The second way. Second way is uh, uh, we don't use a t-ratio anymore. We use uh, something called p-value. P-value will be something computer going to calculate for us. As once computer find the corresponding p-value, our job is very, very simple. If p-value is less than 0 0.05, we reject the null. If p-value is less than 0 0.05, we reject the null. Hence, let's, you know, let's compare the two methods. The first method is if t is large, we reject the null in terms of absolute value. If T is large, is large, right? Large T. Or in the second method, if we have a small P, right? So the T ratio, how large is large? T, T ratio, if, if it is larger than 1.96, we call it large, right? If we have a large T, we reject it now, right? Second way, if we have a small P, how small is small? 
smaller than 0.05, then we reject the null, right? <laughs> That's basically the idea. So that let me show you how to do it, and then I'll tell you more details about uh, intuition. Yes. Again, let's go back to the example. Now, computer already calculated the T-ratio, which is a negative 4.253, right? Once computer have this T-ratio, computer is going to automatically report to the next number, which is a P-value. Computer calculates the corresponding number for us. So computer says the P-value corresponding to beta is 0 0.000108 which is very small. This is uh, definitely smaller than 0 0.05, right? So that, so that since our p-value is smaller than 0 0.05, so that we reject the h null, right? Uh, our h null is zero, beta is a zero. We reject h null, it mean, basically means beta cannot be zero, it's non-zero, right? See, they correspond to each other. In the first way, we got a large p. How large is large? is with larger than 1.96, right? If you got a large T, we reject the null. Second way, if you have a small P, how small is small? Smaller than 0 0.05, right? So right here, it is smaller than 0 0.05, right? So that, that's why they two are equivalent. So either have a large T or have a small P, right? Question. Uh, Yes, but uh, uh, but we don't have to, <laughs> right? Because computer automatically reports that number. Fun. Right, right. But by using computers or a, get a T table, we can def definitely, you know, given whenever given a T ratio, we can always find its corresponding P value. But either use computer or use a T table uh, at the very very end of the textbook. <laughs> right, not as simple as a plus minus. You have to, you know. <laughs> uh, as compare method number one and method number two. Of course, uh, method number two is easy because 0 0.05 is very easy to remember. Where does this number come from? Which is a 5%, 5% confident, you know, second entry level, right? So the second way we always compare with versus 0 0.05. The first way, the first way, strictly speaking, the cutting off value, roughly speaking, is 1.96, right? If you really want to look for the precise number, you have to check it from by use, either use computer or from a t-table, right? That's why the first way is very straightforward, but may not be precise. The second way will be will be very handy. Simply always, you know, just remember a number 0 0.05. Always compare what is 0 0.05, right? That's why that's why the second way, the second way, frankly speaking, second way will be the most popular way. You can directly jump to the p-value and compare what is 0 0.05. That's the most straight, most you know, a straightforward way, right? So so far we have two ways. Method number three, we calculate something called confidence interval. Confidence interval, in short, we call the CI, CI, confident interval. CI, CI is a range. We have a lower bound, upper bound. Let's take a closer look. Lower bound is beta hat minus something. Upper bound is beta hat plus something. Actually, they are very, very similar to each other. Let's take a clo closer look. Beta hat, lower bound is beta hat minus something times standard error beta hat. Upper bound is plus something times a standard error beta hat, right? They're very kind of symmetric. In other words, in other words, beta hat minus something, beta hat plus something, they two are exactly, exactly the same right here, right? So, so that actually immediately, you know, the CI, this range must be centered must be centered at a beta hat. Beta hat minus something, beta hat plus something, right? So the CI range must be centered at a beta hat. So, so what are numbers right here? Standard error of, of beta hat, it is the second column in our regression, you know, her regression result, I just showed you, right? What's this number? This is the uh, cutting off value, precise cutting off value, you know, in our case, for example, 
you know, if your sample size is really large, roughly speaking, it's 1.96, right? So that roughly speaking, it's beta hat minus 1.96 times standard error beta hat. And a beta hat plus 1.96 times standard error beta hat. For example, for example, let's go back to the regression results right here. Roughly speaking, roughly speaking, the lower bound will be will be beta hat minus 1.96 times this number. So that let let's check out this uh, by ourselves. Let's manually let's manually check out this number. This is our beta hat minus roughly speaking 1.96. Oops. Roughly speaking, 1.96 times standard error, right? So lower bound, roughly speaking, is negative 1.75. Upper bound, upper bound, roughly speaking, it's negative 0.64, right? So as I told you, CI, confidence interval, is a range, lower bound, upper bound. Lower bound is negative 1.75. Upper bound is negative uh, 0 0.64, right? Both are negative numbers. So, so, so what's the usage of this uh, CI range? The way we use a CI range is uh, we check out this. We check out if a, C, if a zero is outside the CI uh, confidence interval or not. If, uh, if a zero is really outside the CI range, reject each null. If a zero outside CI range, reject H now. Why? Let me give you intuition. This CI range basically is something like this. Uh, let me draw a line. This is my CI range. I got uh, lower bound, upper bound. Right. I got a lower bound, I got a upper bound. The center right here must be my beta hat, right? Beta hat center right here. Beta hat minus something, I calculate lower bound. Beta hat plus something, I got that number right here. In my in my example, how large they are? Uh, let me, um, let me switch to computer. In my example, Lower bound 1.75, upper bound 0 0.64. Let me switch to that one. So lower bound is uh, uh, negative 1.7, is that 75? Something like this. <laughs> upper bound is, uh, Upper bound is uh, negative 0 0.64, I remember, right? That's the confidence into a CI range we just calculated. What's this a CI range? What's the idea? CI range basically is, you know, 95% chance the true beta, the true beta gonna fall within this CI range. Basically, you know, if you want to calculate a CI range, 95% chance the true beta is supposed to locate within this range. So that if you ask me, you know, is that possible that the true beta to be zero? And think about, you know, lower bound negative 1.75, upper bound negative 0. Points, where's my zero? Zero should be somewhere right here, right? Zero is, is here, right? So again, CI range is 95% chance the true beta is supposed to look within that range, right? So now you're asking me, is that possible that true beta could be zero? Zero is somewhere out of there, right? So that I, my answer is, uh, sorry, basically short answer is no, right? As straight as better put it is, uh, the chance will be smaller than 5%, almost impossible, right? So 95% chance true beta should be located within my CI negative negative something to negative something, right? Now you're asking me, is that possible 
two beta to be zero right there? <laughs> my answer is, uh, sorry, no, it's it's not <laughs> zero. It's all side of my CI, right? That's why my answer is, um, you know, short answer is basically no. Two beta, two beta cannot be zero. Right? So that's why I re reject that now. So that's the purpose of a CI. So what's the advantage of this uh, CI range? CI range is uh, once I calculate this range, negative lower bound, upper bound, as I told you, 95% chance true beta should have supposed to locate within this range, right? So once I calculated the CI, I can perform test for any beta you're, you want to meet a test. For example, suppose you want to you want to meet a test. Is it possible that true beta equals to say negative three? Where's my negative three? Negative three must be somewhere this direction, right? Negative three is here, right? So again, negative three is outside of my CI range, right? So that my answer will be basically no, two beta cannot be negative three, right? Or similarly, if you ask me, is it possible that two beta equals, let's say, positive two? Positive two is a zero, one, two, uh, somewhere this direction, right? Again, my, my answer is as short answer, no, two beta cannot be two, right? Or similarly, is it possible that two beta somewhere, say, equals to negative one? Negative one, yes, it is uh, within my CI range, right? Now my answer is say yes, it is possible true beta could be negative one, right? So that's, that's the beauty of this uh, CI range. Basically, once I calculate the CI range, I can perform any test, any number you want me to test, right? Method number one, method number two, they are only for beta zero or not. Right, but method number three, CI, I can perform any test you want me to do. Right, that's the beauty of a CI. That's the advantage of CI. So, let's summarize these three methods. Method number one, uh, method number one, it is a most straightforward way, most straightforward way. So, so that, so that given beta hat, standard error beta hat. We can always calculate the ratio. Very simple, right? First number divided by second number, so that we got our third number. Compare what is at one point ninety six. If it is large, we reject a null. It's a straightforward, but not precise because we just mentioned the cutting off value. Actually, it varies based on your n and k, right? Method number two is the most popular way. It's the easiest one because because as long as we have a computer. Computer always report to the corresponding p value. If p value is less than 0 0.05, then we reject an L, right? So that's the second way is the most uh, popular way because that's easy. And we always compare what is 0 0.05. Method number three, we calculate the CI range so that uh, we need to do some calculation. But once we calculate the range so that we can perform any test you want me to do, right? That's an advantage. Some, uh, some technical details. In my computer example, this is the regression I just showed you. So that the first way, first way we calculate uh, the computer says T ratio, first number divided by second number, which is the third number, right? Computer says T ratio is a negative four point something. If you really want to calculate the precise cutting off value, I provide the I provide the formula for you. It's a you know negative QT you know quantity from a T distribution by using 0 0.025, which is half of a five percent. And 44, 44 is my n minus k, right? So that if you really want to calculate the precise cutting off value, you can use uh, this formula. But you don't have to for our homework. Uh, for our homework, you don't have to. In our later exams, you don't have to. So for our homework and the later exam, you know, that's the formula to calculate the precise cutting off value. <laughs> but for our homework and uh, exam, you don't have to do so. <laughs> so that uh, uh, if, if in the homework or exam, if I ask you to do it by using T ratio, just use 1.96 <laughs> to, to be simple, right? <laughs> Question? Three methods, in fact, it is between which one? As you mentioned, second method is more popular. Yeah, second way. 
Uh, method number three is, uh, as we mentioned just now, if you want to perform multiple tests, yes, right? If you want to test, uh, is that possible beta is zero? Is that possible beta is a negative one? Is that possible beta is a positive two? <laughs> so on so forth, right? In that case, CI will be very handy. Uh, if you just want to perform beta is a zero or not, I'll say second way will be will be the you know the the easiest one to directly jump to p value. The first way, uh, especially for those undergrad uh, econometrics, it will be a good exercise. Calculate the ratio so that it's uh, easier to understand the where does come from, right? But again, it's not precise, right? That's the trade off. The second method, uh, if the p value is exactly 0.0. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's tricky. Then uh, we can see. I, I don't know. You know, the computer. <laughs> it's probably really, really rare to find exactly zero one zero five. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'll see how does computer do in that case <laughs> in a second. But. <laughs> Right, that's the precise. That's the precise uh, cutting off value. You know, if you want to find out precise cutting off t value, that's the corresponding computer codes. So you can find it from by using R. But again, for our homework, not required. Second method, p value. You know, always reported by computer. It's right here, right? So that uh, directly use this number, comparable as 0 0.05. By, <laughs> by the way, yeah, uh, quite a place, uh, listen to me. By the way, computer always print out some stars afterwards to make it easy for us. So that this number, this number, if it is between zero and the 0 0.001, computer print out three stars. If, if your number between 0 0.01 and uh, 0 0.001, between these two, they have two stars. If, uh, if your number between these two numbers, you get one stars. Finally, if your p-value larger than 0 0.05, then no stars anymore, right? So we, you might get a little, little dot if it between, if it larger than 0 0.05, but still, you know, kind of close, right? Finally, if a larger than 0 0.1, nothing pointed out to there. So a quick answer is uh, as long as you have some star, no matter one star, two stars, three stars, it means you know smaller than 0 0.05, right? So the answer is uh, as long as it have some some stars, any stars, so that we your answer is uh, less than the, your p value can less than 0 0.05. Quick answer. Uh, so that's why you know these uh, stars will be even even better, right? So method number three, method number three. Just now I showed you how to do calculate those uh, CI manually, but if you have computer, you don't have to manually calculate. We have a computer command just called uh, conf int, conf int. You can just calculate conf int all or less. Then computer are going to calculate the confident interval for alpha and beta. For example, let me show you. Let me show you. Uh, if you do, if you do conf int, all or less, all or less is my all or less regression, right? Then computer are going to report confident interval for beta and confident interval for alpha. So the second row, LMP, that's for our beta, right? So it's pretty close to, to the number we calculated manually. <laughs> number we calculated manually use a 1.96, may not be precise. So computer calculate number is, that's the most precise confidence interval, right? So if you have computer, you can simply use a conf int interval, conf, uh, conf int, conf int, short for confidence interval, you know, for, for all of this, right? If you want to the beta only, if you want to the beta only, you can specify double quotes, double, you know, L and P only, right? Or two comma, second row only. So that's some uh, detail. Um, one technical detail. So far, no matter, no matter which way, 
no matter which way, for example, say method number one, if my T ratio larger than 1.6, I reject an out. If, uh, if you get a large T, small P, or zero outside range, range we reject an out, right? What's the opposite? For example, suppose your, suppose your T ratio smaller than cutting off, then what's your conclusion? If my T ratio, for example, something like a four or negative four, which is larger than 1.96, right? My conclusion is I reject an out. Basically, beta cannot be zero. Opposite, suppose my T ratio is say uh, 0 0.5, which is smaller than 1.96, right? Then what's, what's our conclusion in this case? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, <laughs> right. First of all, I'm very happy to see you know here you guys uh, some of you mentioned the right answer, which is right here. Otherwise, fail to reject the H now. Fail to reject now. Hence, hence uh, some undergrad level econometrics book says the opposite. They says. You know, otherwise, accept the no. I would say, never say that. That's a wrong way. That's a wrong way to to put a conclusion. Why? Again, otherwise, otherwise, the right way, the correct way should be fail to reject the no. It's technically speaking, it's incorrect to say accept the no. Never say accept the no. So why? Let me explain this way. Uh, think about the situation that, for example, suppose we uh, uh, we have a murder, so someone has been killed, right? So that the policeman, uh, once we catch the suspect, the policeman need to collect a lot of information, such as uh, hopefully we have a witness, hopefully we get a fingerprint, hopefully we have a blood type, hopefully we have uh, many, many evidence so that we, we can... Uh, we we successfully proved that this guy is the murderer so that we can put him in jail, right? <laughs> That's the case if we have enough evidence. How about the opposite? Suppose we catch the suspect, but unfortunately, we don't have enough evidence. We don't have a uh, witness. We don't have uh, a blood type. We don't have, uh, you know, DNA, so, 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 so forth. We don't have enough evidence. Then what's the conclusion for the policeman? <laughs> First of all, the right way to conclude for the policeman should be, we fail to prove he's guilty. If we do have enough evidence, our conclusion is that, yes, we, you know, we proved he is guilty. He is the mother, right? But if we do not have enough evidence, our conclusion should be we fail to prove his guilty, right? In other words, we cannot say, technically speaking, it is incorrect to say, I proved he's innocent. I proved he's not the mother. Why is wrong? Because the truth might be he is, <laughs> he really kid, he is the mother, right? <laughs> but simply, we don't have enough evidence, right? So that, that's why, technically speaking, it's incorrect for us to say, I proved he's innocent. I proved he, he didn't kill anybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> because, you know, it could be wrong. Don't make th that kind of conclusion. We simply, we don't have enough evidence to, 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 sh to, to show his, you know, his mother, right? So in that case, if you do not, ha do not have enough evidence, our right conclusion should be, I fail to prove he is the murderer. I fail to prove his, uh, you know, <laughs> his guilty, right? That's why, that, that, you know, correspondingly, in our case, never say accept no. Never say accept no. We always say we fail to prove. <laughs> we fail to, fail to reject no, right? So that's why after my, my class, Never say accept and not, so that in our homework 
you know, or exam, if you your if your conclusion is if you write down something like uh, I accept it now, sorry, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let my TA to take some points off. <laughs> you know, it will be shame on me if you still say <laughs> accept it now after my class. Right? Never say that. Of course, I uh, if you uh, during your discussion with your advisor. Informally, you know, informal conversation. If you say accept, I don't mind. But very formally, write down something. You know, like your dissertation, like your uh, homework, exam, so on so forth. Never use those words such as uh, accept, because technically speaking, it's incorrect, right? So that uh, that's why I go back to homework. Uh, 